Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video, enjoying another of our top 10 lists. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic is 10 things the New Testament Christians did daily. It's common in the West for people to greet each other with the words, have a good day, but no one ever tells you how to do this. That's why we decided to have a look at the believers in the first century and see how they had good days, even in the darkest times. Maybe this will give us some practical hints for having good days every day. Let's get started. Our first thing that we see in the New Testament that the Christians did daily was daily fellowship. We read here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 46, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of the heart, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord adding to the church daily. So what a wonderful illustration of the encouragement that believers have for one another. In spite of all the opposition outside, when they were persecuted, the scripture says, as soon as they were released, they went to their own people. They gathered with the people of God. And the more we do this in dark times, the more encouragement we'll find in Christ in one another. That's really the secret of the happiness and joy that these Christians had. Our second daily occurrence is daily witness and souls being saved. No wonder if we sow the seed daily, we'll reap daily. The scripture says that if we sow much, we reap much. And if we sow to the Spirit, we will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So there in Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 47, we read, The Lord added to the church daily those being saved. What a thrill it would be to see those days again in our country where daily people are responding to the gospel. Our third daily thing is uh, daily care for widows and the poor. Right, we read in uh, chapter 6 that there arose a complaint against the Hebrew Christians by the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Christians, because the widows that were associated with the Greek-speaking believers were being neglected in the daily distribution. So they felt that some of the funds were being unequally distributed. And it was at that point that the apostles then got them to recognize seven deacons. And interestingly, all the deacons had Greek names, so it seemed like they weren't taking any chances. They wanted to make sure that their widows were looked after. But the key operative phrase here is, they were neglected in the daily distribution. So the widows were being visited every day. They were being cared for every day. And as much as they appreciated the groceries, I think it was the contact with fellow believers that was very precious to them. It would be a wonderful thing if we took a few minutes on our way to work, our way home from work, just to pop in and see one of the widows. Just a little word, give them a call. I'm stopping at the grocery store. Can I bring you something? and just keep it short and sweet, but regularly contacting the widows would be a wonderful ministry to have. And number four, daily searching of the scriptures. Now this specifically speaks of the Bereans, but I think it was true as we read through the Word of God, we see how attached they were to the Word of God. They were constantly reasoning in the scriptures, going into the synagogues, into the schools of the philosophers, into the marketplace. They were constantly in the Word of God. And so we read that uh, the Bereans searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. That's Acts 17, verse 11. Our next one is daily concern for and warning of the churches. Now, what does that include? Well, obviously, uh, with all these new believers, with all their hang-ups and their baggage, uh, the picture that's used in the scripture of the disciples 
unwrapping the grave clothes of Lazarus. And it seems when people get saved, there's a lot of that from the old way of life that needs to be sorted through. And there were also a lot of false philosophies that were flooding through the world at that time, like Gnosticism and asceticism and, and Jewish legalism that needed to be countermanded, needed to be corrected. And so this was a daily care for the churches. The elders didn't simply show up uh, for an elders meeting once a week. They were among the flock, caring for God's people. And so we read the apostle as he speaks to the elders of Ephesus at Miletus in his going away speech as he describes his life's ministry. And he says to them, therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn every one of you night and day with tears. So this is, this is total commitment. This is on-the-job training. And Paul was taking younger men like Timothy and Titus and Luke, and he was showing them this lifestyle that, that the New Testament church is not a hobby that you sort of pop into now and again. It's a way of life. God designed it that way. Some people want token commitment, stop in at a mega church, spend a few minutes and leave and nobody notices whether you are there or not. But God designed total commitment because total commitment equals total blessing. Token commitment equals token blessing. And God wanted total blessing for his people. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And this daily concern and warning really goes along with our next one, is that there were daily attacks against the people of God. Someone has said, I think it was an English bishop in the church said, wherever Paul went, there was either a riot or a revival. He said, wherever I go, they serve tea. <laughs> and, you know, I think the church today use so much tact, they don't make contact. When we preach the gospel, we don't mean to be offensive, but there is an offense of the cross. And the Lord said, in the world you shall have tribulation. This wasn't something that was possible or optional. It was going to happen. And if we live godly in Christ Jesus, we will suffer persecution. So as we seek a godly path, we're going contrary to the world. We're not floating like a dead fish. We're swimming upstream and we're going to face opposition. That's the way it was with the church then. And so we read, quoting Psalm 44, verse 22, Paul quotes it in Romans 8, and he says, the quote is, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But Paul can go on now from that quote in the Psalms to add these words, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. This is something a friend of mine told me. He said, you know, in many of these high persecution countries, the first thing the first generation of Christians get to do is to die for Christ. And in dying for Christ, people have never seen anyone die like that. And it moves the whole country to be less antagonistic to the gospel. They wonder, how can people die like that? And that's exactly what's happened when these young Egyptian men were slaughtered by ISIS down at the Mediterranean shore. Their dying words were the name of Jesus and forgiveness for their murderers. Thinking that this would demoralize the Christians in Egypt and empower the Muslims, it, it ended up doing the opposite, where the president of Egypt went into a Christian church and instructed the Muslims to get to know their Christian neighbors and to ask for their forgiveness and to find out how is it possible to die like that. And the churches have been flooded with people seeking after the Lord because no one has ever seen anybody die like that. So even in this, they were daily more than conquerors through the Lord. Our seventh is daily prayer and labor for the saints. Yes, Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 1.3, Without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day. Now, this may seem to be quite implausible, quite impractical. 
are you kidding me? Like, I work all day. I have to concentrate on my job. I, I have a family to look after. I can't pray night and day. And yet the scripture says that we are to pray without ceasing. And I love the way that Robert Cleaver Chapman explained that verse when he said, turn everything in life into something to talk to God about. So the idea that he's a very present help and I'm just carrying on a conversation with him. And I may be thanking him, I may be pleading with him, I may be worshiping him, I may be interceding for someone else, whatever it is, everything that comes my way, I turn it heavenward. We see this beautifully in the life of Nehemiah and how when the enemy was peering over the gates and calling down epithets and curses on him, he didn't even respond directly to them. He just said, Lord, you hear them. Would you look after this for me? It's beautiful. And that's, it seems, how Paul lived his life, that as they came to mind, he would lift them up to the Lord. He would pray for them. And it's, it's a tremendous relief when we realize that this is the casting of all our care on him. This is how we do it. Say, Lord, this is too big for me. You handle this. And that was a characteristic of the early church, daily prayer and care for the people of God. And this moves right into caring for the people of God, number eight, daily encouragement of one another. Yes, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13 says, exhort or encourage one another daily while it is called today. In other words, underlining the fact that we can't do anything tomorrow. The devil's word is tomorrow. Get saved tomorrow. Serve God tomorrow. God's word is today. Today is the day of salvation, and today is the day of service. And today is the day I need to encourage my fellow believers. And if we would take this not as a suggestion, but as a command, it would revolutionize our churches. If I would not go to sleep tonight until I found a way to encourage another Christian, it may be some homemade cookies, it may be a phone call, it may be some flowers, it may be a visit, whatever it is, I find a way to move others forward. And that's what the word encourage means, to add courage, to strengthen them by real and honest communication of my love and God's truth and the Spirit's ministry. And we can't be the same. We're going to advance every day that someone is there with their arm in ours saying, come on, brother, let's keep going. Come on, sister. We're encouraged, and we want you to be encouraged too. They did it daily, and we need to do it every day. And then we have daily increase of the church. You know, your heart just goes out to this great nation, uh, wherever you happen to be living, and saying, our hearts are longing to see people saved. They're so burdened. They're so lost. They're so dark. They look to the world for something, and there's nothing there. It's just a black hole, and we have the answer. And as they shared the gospel and as they lived Christ, the Bible tells us that the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. That's Acts 16.5. So every day the church was growing. Now you understand what that means. If you see, as in the day of Pentecost, about 3,000 saved, and then a few days later, about 5,000 saved. There were about 500 core believers that the Lord had worked with. And all of a sudden now, everybody has a living room full of new believers, baby Christians to care for. So everybody was involved in discipling. And that's how it ought to be. Now, you know, you don't have to take a college course to have a baby. And you don't need to have a seminary degree to care for a new believer. Just show them what you know. Just show them how to pray. Show them how to read the scripture, how to understand, how to witness. These are simple skills every believer should have, and we should be showing others as they come along. And if we did, if we had a heart to care for baby lambs, I think God would give us more lambs to care for. And then, most importantly, number 10, never forget what the Lord is doing daily. The whole theme of the book of Acts is that these are the things, says Luke, that Jesus began to do and to teach 
referring to the Gospel of Luke, these are the things in the book of Acts that Jesus continued to do and teach, but he was doing them through his body, the church. And so we read this phrase, the Lord working with them. At the very moment he was leaving to go back to heaven, he says to them, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. It doesn't say, except for the last few years. The Lord is still here with us. And what is he doing? He's not only doing something through us, he's doing something in us. And so we read, therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And Paul could say to the Christians, I'm confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's not going to give up on his project. Someday you're going to be like Christ. And every day, although you may feel discouraged and feel like you've had setbacks, he is never set back. He is never behind schedule. And he is methodically using negative things and positive things and working them all for our good. He is slowly moving us forward to the day when we shall see him as he is and we shall be like him. And so Paul says, I'm confident of this, that the work he's begun in you, he will continue to perform it until that day called the day of Jesus Christ, when he has all the headlines, when everybody is beholding his glory and everyone is reflecting his image because Jesus did what he said he would do and he has made us like himself.